there are some artists, not because of the artists, but because the record companies are just lip syncing the whole time. Right. And they even have certain pads on the drums. So if you hit the drum, there's no sound. It's dead. Oh. And in pianos, they'll actually mute out. So if it's an acoustic piano where there's the hammers and stuff, it doesn't hit anything. So you could hit, you could hit notes, you could hit amps, you could hit nothing. All right, hey everyone, welcome back to Singing Simply, where through tips, tutorials, and interviews like these, we aim to simplify everything related to learning to sing. So today I'm very, very, very excited to have Eddie Louisi, who is the Sage Manager on America's number one morning talk show, Good Morning America. Thank you very, very much for joining the show. You're welcome, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Eddie. So I really wanted to start off, so you've got a, an incredible career in the industry and have been on Good Morning America for over three decades. Well, where did all of this kind of start for you? Okay, that's a long story. So do we have like two or three hours here? <laughs> I, got, I got my coffee so I could hang out all day long. <laughs> um, well, you, you mentioned in the intro that this is gonna be, you know, you do simple things. I'm more complex than simple, so just sort of let you know, but I, I'm gonna try to- Absolutely. Um, in, in a nutshell, okay? I went to Hunter College, New York City. It's a CUNY school, right? Studio University. I took up communications. I eventually got an internship at WPX TV Channel 11 where they do Yankee baseball. I got hired while I was still in school. Then after that, I started sending out resumes mm. all over California, New York, because I wanted to do entertainment, not news and sports. I started freelancing at the soap opera for all my children. And then eventually I did Good Morning America. Do you want me to tell you my little story of Good Morning America or you want to move on to something else? I'd love to hear it. Okay, so I freelance, right? As a stage manager, a stage manager is a person who's in charge of the set, right? And we, we make sure everybody's in place, all the actors on air talent. So I was hired to do a January 1st show because mm. the regular stage managers wanted a party on New Year's Eve, so they wanted the day off. So <laughs> I come in, I've never seen the show before. So I kind of come in, as you would say, blind or green, like I didn't know the show. And the other stage manager only did the show like two or three times. Mm. The whole time I do the show, right? It's a two hour live show. I'm on headsets, I'm doing the show. I'm getting yelled at the whole time by the director because I'm mm. doing this wrong, I'm doing that wrong, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> So eventually I don't get called for 11 months. Mm. I get called 11 months later. This time I do the show with one of the steady, the, uh, the main stage managers. So he shows me what to do. I don't get yelled at. I also all of a sudden become the number one backup because mm. I did the, you know, I'm a good stage manager. I just didn't know the show. That's why I was messing up. <laughs> so eventually I talked to the director. His name is Don Roy King. Don right now is the director of Saturday Night Live. So he's like really, really, really popular. But he was, you know, popular to Good Morning America. Uh -huh. I said, Don, I said, I did the show 11 months ago. You yelled at me the whole time. And then I didn't get called. I said, why are you calling me now? He said, well, Ed, let me just tell you, I had a stack of names of stage managers as backups. And I fired them all. And you were the next one. So that's why you, I called you in. <laughs> so that's the story how I got into Good Morning America as a backup. Mm -hmm. And then eventually one of the stage managers moved to California and I became the number, uh, you know, the steady person there. So fantastic, fantastic. Well, um, so if we've talked about how you, you entered, what kind of motivates or motivated you to stay there? I mean, like you've been there for, uh, for um, quite some time. Like what yeah. motivates you to do the things you do? So working in television, right? There's all different genres, there's all different styles. You have news, sports, entertainment, you have live, you have taped, you, you have network, you have local, you have cable. Good Morning America is live, mm. it's network, it's a little bit of everything. It's news, it's entertainment, it's steady work five days a week. So for me, it's, the perfect fit. It's just a mm. wonderful show to be on. 
because I'm working five days a week. I'm doing live television two hours a day. And I meet presidents, I meet politicians, authors, mm -hmm. models, celebrities, actors, musicians. So every day, even though as a stage manager, I do the same job, you know, I stand by the camera five, four, three, and I cue. But every day is different because the rundown, the guest is different, and, and then different things are happening. So I might be doing, right now we're in, in COVID. So right now mm -hmm. things are mellow, but pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, we would have a musical act. So I have a full, mm. you know, Alicia Keys band on the set. Then somewhere in the other thing would have a cooking spot and then would would have, you know, Dancing with the Stars and, and then we have a celebrity interview. So it was fun. It was crazy. It was busy, but it was fun. So that's the reason why I love Good Morning America so much. Fantastic. It sounds like a lot of fun. I didn't realize that there were like so many different kind of stages happening concurrently, which is really, really cool. Um, I wanted to dive a bit into that, um, Eddie. So you've worked with so many kind of big name artists um, because I did see that list you sent over. It was crazy. Adam Lambert, Alicia Keys, Coldplay, One Direction. That list is quite endless. Um, who have been some of your favorite that you've worked with so far? And maybe any funny stories that came out of that? <laughs> so I loved Amy Grant. Amy Grant is a Christian artist, right? Mm -hmm. She started out as a Christian artist and then she went pop and stuff. Um, Back in the old days, we had this big, big board. So when guests mm. would exit after they did the performance, they would sign it. It would be an autograph oh. wall. And then after it was full, we would donate it to some charity. And, oh. and, and so it, it was a really wonderful thing. So I asked Amy Grant, I said, would you like to sign our wall? She goes, yeah, thank you. So she's standing there and she's standing there and she's standing there. And it's like after five minutes, she writes, love Amy Grant. So I, I, I'm standing by her and I go, yeah, I said, that was really original. And she goes, shut up, Ed. I said, why don't you write that on the wall? So she writes, shut up, Ed, love Amy Grant. So that was really funny. And, and that was 1988. Hmm. Her road manager, his name is Chaz Corzine. Hmm. Chaz now is a big shot in the, in the music business. He, hmm. he's the manager. He was a, a partner in a, in a big company. And we are still friends after 30 something years. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about friends in the spirit one, one, one and my podcast, but he contacted Chaz out of the blue contacted K loves access more, which is K love is a Christian radio station mm -hmm. and they want to expand, not just do radio. So they want to do other things. So they started this whole podcast division called access more and Chaz contacted the main people there to see if they could get my podcast on Access More. If oh, that were to oh. happen, not only hundreds of people would be listening, hundreds of thousands, if not a million. So what a mm. blessing that could be if that happens. So pretty great. Yeah. And and it's just it just is a testament to the power of networking and meeting the right people. Just just yes. because obviously with the right people, there's so much stuff you can do. Um, I, I wanted to kind of ask about, um, so you've obviously worked with all these kind of, kind of, kind of big names. Um, I, one, one thing I noticed is that there is so much kind of talent and skill in the industry. And obviously as someone who's kind of interacted with them, and as, as I know you're a musician yourself as well, what, what do you kind of think separates these kind of bigger name artists from those, from the rest actually? Interesting. Mm. So I see difference in all these big name artists, okay? Mm. I see some people that are just, it's all about them. They have their entourage. Uh. You can't look them in the eye. You can't this, you can't that. And then I have some of these big, big shots that just come in, sound checked in their jeans and t-shirt, very humbly. Uh. <laughs> they have their coffee. They say hi to people. And I could, just like I'm chatting with you, I could be one, two feet from them and just chit chat and this and that, and they're down to earth. Where uh -huh. other people, you have to talk to their manager and you have to talk uh -huh. to this. So I've seen the gamut of all that. Yeah. Um, and me personally, being a musician, um, the, the main artist, the celebrity, they're cool and they're fun, but mm -hmm. I enjoy the background musicians a hundred times more. Uh -huh. Especially when I see a musician, like I don't know if you know the name Steve Gadd, but Steve Gadd is a famous drummer He's in his 60s now, if not 70 years old. Mm -hmm. He's played with everybody. 
So if I see a Steve Gadd, I'm like, wow, excited. Or a Nathan <laughs> East, who's a famous bass player, because these people have played on hundreds and thousands of albums of all different artists. Where, yeah. you know, you have James Taylor. James Taylor's great, and James Taylor's James Taylor. But mm -hmm. Steve Gadd has played with James Taylor and Paul Simon and with all, you know, thousands of other groups. So mm -hmm. I always joy you know talking and hanging out with the band more than the actual artists fantastic fantastic cool um actually it was actually cool to kind of see your perspective on that because i think uh, obviously a lot of times the attention will be on the kind of bigger names uh, or, or, or at least sometimes right um I, I would like to dive a bit deeper into your role eddie so um say say for example if demi lovato comes onto the show for a live gig but what would be like a bit of like the kind of the prep work or like some of the behind the scenes that would you would kind of focus on um, when she jumps on the show? So me as a stage manager, Demi has been on many, many times. Okay, uh -huh. So I know Demi as a young little girl. And <laughs> when she used to come on years ago, my daughters who are now 13, 18 and 21, they were little girls. They would mm. come and they would hug and kiss Demi. Oh. She was like a sweetheart. Mm. Um, and also Selena Gomez and the Cheetah Girls and Jonas Brothers and all those, you know, different Disney groups and stuff. For me, let's say I'm doing a, a GMA, Good Morning America, summer concert series, okay? We started the summer concert series as Bryant Park, which is in 42nd Street in Manhattan. And then after several years, we moved to Central Park. Mm. As a stage manager, I would come in, I would have a meeting with the director and the crew. We'd mm -hmm. have a rundown so we'd know all the different hits, all the different song segments mm -hmm. we're doing, little teasers like what you do we, or little bumpers, we call it. Bumpers. Then I go on to the actual stage and I usually meet the road manager or the production manager of the band and uh -huh. shake hands. And then I give him a rundown or her and we go over the rundown and I say, These, this is what we're going to do. This is what I need, blah, 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 blah. I tell them in between song one and two, there's a two minute commercial in between song two and three, we're going to bring director's chairs and have an interview. Uh -huh. So I kind of do all that behind the scenes. Most of the time, the artists, depending on who they are, right? Like I said earlier, some of them will come real early and they'll come and hang out and they'll sound check and they'll be really, I could chit chat with them. Some of them will just sound check behind the set with a microphone. They don't want to be seen. So uh -huh. they'll just test, test, test. They have the ears in, they're happy. And then the first time they're on the stage, the first time the audience sees them is live for national TV. So they want this whole big type of entrance and this, you know, so, excuse me. So everything really depends, you know, but as a stage manager, I'm, I'm the person that's in between the control room, the director and producers mm. and the talent. So mm. if the control room director producers are having a rough day and it's crazy and they're yelling <laughs> and stuff like that, I get it and I have to filter it and call <laughs> on the talent. Because if I'm all nervous and all this and that, that makes yeah. the, the on-air talent that. Or if the on-air talent's getting all nervous and stuff, I have to try to calm them down. And um, my wife... Uh, told me because I've had on Facebook, I have a lot of old photos of, of different <laughs> artists and celebrities mm -hmm. I work with. And several people said, Ed, you should write a book. I said, well, I don't yeah. want to write a book with just celebrity pictures. Like that's kind of boring, mm -hmm. but I'm a very spiritual friend, right? I have a ministry called Friends in the Spirit 111. My mm -hmm. wife said, why don't you write a book and call it Cue the Spirit? Because as oh, a stage cool. manager, I cue, but I also cue the spirit. I've mm. been at GMA for, like you said, over three decades. My spirit, my personality has been involved, entrenched with the walls, the studios of GMA and all the different people from the host to the guests, to the audience members, mm. to people like my dear friend, Michael Amory Sherlock, who was a guest of Robin Roberts. I, so as a stage manager, my spirit, my my work ethic, my professionalism touches many different people. So um, 
So you never know, maybe somewhere in the future, cue the spirit, where a book will happen. But you know, right now we're, we're not pursuing it, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm excited. I'm very, very excited because you've obviously got um, a lot of experience and, and almost like a, a really awesome journey um, to kind of share. Um, okay, well, I mean, have you, have you worked on non-live sessions? So I know GMA is a live kind of two hour set. Well, is there any kind of differences when you run those recordings versus the live sessions? So for me, I love live because uh-huh. live, you do it, it's done, goodbye. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you do anything taped, taped music, taped mm. acting, like I worked on all the soap operas. I worked on all my children, One Life to Live, Ryan's Hope, Loving, Another World. Oh. I've done all that. Uh-huh. Once you work on anything that's taped, right? If it's not up to par, stop, do it again, take one, uh, take two, take right. three, take 10, or musician wise, you know, oh, I, I didn't like the, the guitar in my ear, or I didn't like this, or or my my voice cracked, you know, at this one part. So you do it again. Because mm. just like us, we're doing a chit chat and, mm. and we're chatting live, but you're taping it. So I asked you earlier, are you gonna edit anything out? And you said, <laughs> yes, or no. So this is kind of like live. So if I mess up or say something silly or whatever, um, <laughs> But certain celebrities want a certain perfection. And then also sometimes the the celebrity, the musical artist, they don't really care. They just want Mm. to be themselves. If they make a little mistake or whatever, they want it to go out naturally. But Mm. sometimes the record company doesn't want it. The record Uh. company wants perfection. And I guess because you do a lot of audio stuff, a lot of your... um, your people that watch your show know about audio and pro tools and stuff. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of musical artists that backstage there's pro tool tracks that are playing in addition to the musicians. Okay. Uh, mm. So we have a stage manager backstage queuing pro tools and then a a stage manager front of house working with the musicians. Yeah. People always ask what is real? What, what's going out on the air? You know, is, is their voice going out of the musicians going out? And I say, I don't know because Mm -hmm. I am not in the audio booth that actually sends all the sound out. Mm -hmm. All I know is they're hearing tracks. So tracks are going in their ears, tracks are coming through the speakers and they're playing. There are some artists, not because of the artists, but because the record companies are just lip syncing the whole time. And they even have certain pads on the drum. So if you hit the drum, there's no sound. It's dead. Oh. And in pianos, they'll actually mute out. So if it's an acoustic piano where there's the hammers and stuff, it doesn't hit anything. So you could hit you could hit notes, you could hit amps, you could hit nothing. So they're just faking it. And oh. it's like, for me personally, since I'm a musician and I'm there live, it's like, come on, man, just play. <laughs> I want I want to hear the band or play without tracks, you know. Mm. And whenever there's a band, like a lot of the country bands, they don't play with tracks. Obviously, the jazz artists or people like Tony Bennett or whatever, mm. the musicians just play. Mm. And I'll always joke. I'm saying, you know, I'll say something like, you guys are really playing. You know how to play your instruments? Like, where's Pro Tools? <laughs> wow. And, and, they'll, and they'll start joking with me and stuff like yeah. that. Because everybody that's there, even if there is Pro Tools, they're still great musicians. Mm. It, it just has to do with the sound they want, that perfect sound they want to go out on the air. They mm. want it to be record quality, you know? So I, I get it. Mm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, well, how do you, uh, well, I, I guess uh, I'm not sure if this is something you control, Eddie. But how do you decide who comes onto the show? Is it like, is there like an upper team or like who decides, say, is it Demi Lovato today or like is it another artist? How does that get decided? So yeah, there is an upper team, okay? Mm. So at Good Morning America and all shows, right? You have producers, you have bookers, you have writers, you have researchers, and then you have the crew. Mm. So at Good Morning America, I would say people like musical artists, Mm. That could be booked three months in advance because especially pre-COVID when they're going on tour and stuff. So the the management company of the artists plus our producer bookers, they chat with each other and work out a schedule and say, okay, I'm going to be in New York these right. couple of days. Or I'm in Philly and I could hop on a quick plane and I could do your show and then I could go do my concert. So they pre 
book all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Then all the newsy type stuff, because we are ABC News also, that gets yeah. booked the day before, if not even early in the morning. If something happens, you know, mm-hmm. there's a fire or something or some type of tragic crime scene or whatever, if that's happening at six o'clock in the morning, we change the whole rundown that first half hour and make it, you know, Uh um, very newsy and right. Matter of fact and current. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a bit of like, almost like last minute contingencies and things like a pre-book. And this is why I like, I kind of really respect it. Like there's so many changes going on and it seems like you guys have to really work together, communicate to have things run so smoothly. Um, I want to talk a bit more about you, Eddie. So uh, I, I know you also um, love music, absolutely love it. And you mentioned you're a musician. I know you're associated with uh, uh, ASCAP. How, how would you pronounce that? ASCAP. ASCAP. Tell me a bit more about that. So ASCAP, um, I don't know if I'm going to remember, the American Society of Composers <laughs> and Publishers. I think that's what it is. Um, many years ago, Good Morning America had new management and they wanted to change the theme music. Uh So I said, oh, wow, that's an opportunity of lifetime. Like maybe I could write a new theme and I could get paid, you know, royalties as the composer of Good Morning America. Uh So I had a little keyboard at home that that has uh, tracks built in. So I had this melody Actually, I wrote a song for my wife years ago, kind of like a a love song, but the melody was cool. So I stripped the voice and I just did the melody and I put it on a cassette. You Mm. can tell how old I am because nobody has cassettes (laughs) anymore. But I give it to the senior vice president of ABC, Good Morning America, and I say, hey, you know, I have an idea for a theme. You know, let me know. Give it to him Friday. Monday morning, he comes to work. He said, Eddie, he said, I can't get the theme out of my mind. I really like the Mm. theme but the production quality is really bad. Right. He said, can you, can you pick it up a notch? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to some friends because I, I'm not a big production type studio person. Yeah. So I go to one buddy who's a, who's a, a local friend who has a MIDI studio. He produces it, give it to my VP again. And he says, it's better, but it's still not right. Then I give it to another friend who I met on the set of Good Morning America. He was the piano player for Donna Summer at the time, right? Right. 70 disco artist. And he lived like a half hour from me. So I told him the deal. And so he produced another version, which was better, but still didn't nail it. So now I go to a friend. His name is Michael Whalen. Michael Whalen is a big time composer. And he's an artist now that he does all his original music. So I call him up and I tell him, hey, Michael, I said, I have this theme, ABC. He said, Eddie, he said, I'm not an arranger. I'm a composer. He said, let's make a deal. I said, okay, let's make a deal. He said, I will arrange your theme, but then let me write my own theme and submit both to the DP. So I said, okay, like, what do I have to lose? I go to Michael's studio one day in New York City. He has a baby grand piano. He has a synth here, a synth, an organ. He has a synclavia, which is like a hundred thousand dollar keyboard. Of course. He goes to every <laughs> single keyboard and plays my theme. Every single keyboard, because he wanted to hear it. Mm-hmm. He comes back, he said, let's change the deal. He said, your theme's really good. He said, let's just work on your theme and we'll split it 50-50 writers. Uh-huh. I said, okay. So now we work together and, and we arrange, we make one full theme and then we make different stems, different edits. Now mm-hmm. at the time, Michael was doing a lot of commercials. Uh, so I don't know how much TV experience he had, at least with like a TV show like Good Morning America. So as the stage manager and knowing the show, I know when there's 30 second bumpers, 15, I know there's things in and out and all that. So we make edits from the main theme Mm. of all different splicing and cutting Mm. and then we strip different things so we'll do Mm. one version which is just you know a shaker and piano and a flute and this and that so we made a cd of like 17 different versions ah okay and it it came out really well we didn't get the main theme but we were able to get it on the air like for different bumpers and stuff so at that point i became an ascap composer and publisher because that music got on Good Morning America. Uh, so, so is that it, it? So 
to kind of get into this association, do you need to have like some like some published work? Is, is that the condition yeah. of entry? Ah, it, okay. It, 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 it's kind of like like I'm also in the Directors Guild of America. It's a it's a catch twenty. Is it catch twenty? Catch twenty two? Uh, I always forget what it is, but you can't get a job. You can't get a job unless you're in the union. You can't get in the union unless you have a job. Mm. So you can't get into ASCAP unless you have your music in an ASCAP company. So right, ABC right. is ASCAP. So once the music appeared on ABC, then you get approved to be an ASCAP because then there's all royalties people pay out the royalties and all that sort of stuff. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, cool. So, um, so obviously, like you, you're, um, you've got some composing skills under you. Um, that's really, really awesome. Tell me a bit more about, so you, in, in, in your kind of career so far, what has been some of the kind of more important skills that you've developed so far? In my career? Yeah. And are we talking my music career, my TV career, my ministry career, my mentoring career? Because I have the four M's, media, music, ministry, and mentoring. So right, pick, right. Pick what, what do you think your audience would be more interested in? I'm going to be a bit greedy here. I'd love to yeah. talk about music and mentoring. Okay. Um, so maybe music first, because I think that's that's what we we're talking about just so now. So music first, okay? And and I don't know who your audience is. I'm not sure if they're students, if they're college, mm -hmm. if they're amateurs trying to break in, or they're pros, or a combination. I'm 61 years old right now. When I was in high school, I started playing guitar at 12, mm -hmm. okay? When I was in high school and college, no one mentored me. Mm. I would have loved to have been a professional musician. I would have loved to have been a producer and a songwriter. That that would have been my dream because at a certain age, I started doing music and stopped playing sports. So, But no one mentored me. So mm. no one told me that I should have learned to read music because mm. if I learned to read music, I could have been a session player. I could go into any studio and I could read charts. Okay. I can read chords and I can read basic notes, but I can't sight read music. Mm. I always thought to be a full-time musician, you have to work nights and weekends because mm. I'm always thinking concerts and traveling and small venues, clubs and bars, big concerts are always nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that you could have a job nine to five being a session player, right? So I would have loved to know that there is actual studio work, session players, nine to five. A lot of these session players too, they'll do three or four sessions a day. So they're getting paid three or four times a day. They'll mm. come in, they'll do an hour session or a two hour session. Then they'll do another session. Then they'll hop in the car and do another session. My dear friend, Nathan East, who's a very famous session bass player. Now he's mm. a solo artist too. He used to do that back in the early seventies. They do three sessions a day. And once you get really good, you get like triple pay, you get like golden <laughs> pay. So it's like, so that would have been a, a dream. That would have been something I really would have loved to have done. So mentoring, nobody mentored me into that. Mm. But in chatting with you and in this podcast, and I've done other interviews, I always tell that story about mentoring. Mm. I'm also part of a, an organization called Future Now Media Conference. Mm. And that's more tv type mentoring but i'm a i'm a tv mentor and actually after this interview around eight o'clock or so i'm going to mentor a college student oh. and that's more about careers but they all have different careers some want to be in music and some want to be in broadcast tv and some want to be in education mm. and part of mentoring is just listening listening to people and seeing what their dreams and goals are and then you kind of try to steer them you try to put in your two cents, your experience. And then if you really connect with somebody and you really like them, mm. you introduce them to other people. Mm. You know? Some mm. people have called me a connector. Let me tell you a quick little story. Absolutely. I was uh, a friend of mine, Joan Bear. She's a, a, an author. She writes young adult novels. She had a grandson who just graded, graduated college, and I knew her through a friend, Tony Rossi, the Christophers. I directed some of their TV shows. So they wanted me to mentor the grandson. So we get together for breakfast. It's Joan, her grandson, and me. Tony couldn't make it. He was busy with work. 
we're chit-chatting. I'm spending a half hour giving him different advice mm. and telling him, I'll connect you here. I'll connect you there. I say, look, the bottom line is I'm a stage manager. Mm. As a stage manager, I can't hire you for a job. If you have a hit song, I can't get your song published. If you're mm. an actor, I can't get you a TV job. Like there's things that I'm limited to, mm -hmm. but I've met a lot of people on the set of Good Morning America. And I have this on my LinkedIn page and I have it on my card. I am honored and blessed to have worked with many of the best of the best in all fields of the business. Mm. And I've handed out a lot of business cards. I made mm. a lot of contacts where I could help others. Mm. And so I said, I connect people. Joan, mm. Joan Bear comes up to me face to face. She puts her head like right there. She goes, you're not a connector. You're a divine appointer. You help souls with their divine appointments. Mm. And I went, whoa, I never <laughs> heard that word. Like I'm a spiritual person and I watched The Secret. It, it's a big Netflix documentary. And there's all these experts and they have, you know, the titles underneath them, like the call Chirons or whatever. Right, right, and right. I haven't one person that said divine appointer. Mm. So me and my spiritualness, okay, God, what do you want me to do with that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so I continue to, to help people mentor, do podcasts mm. like this, make connections. We're connected now. So if I could help you in the future to meet different people, or you have some friends that you could introduce me to. It's all about helping each other. You know? I think so too. Yeah. Right. And, and if some types a success happens, if it's monetary or fame or whatever, then wonderful, but just to connect people and to get their um, creativity and, and, and their passion out to other people, you know, I think that's what this world is about. That's powerful. I mean, um, I agree. I think at the end of the day, it's what kind of impact you can spread to other people, uh, which is really cool. And that's really, really awesome of you, Eddie. Um, tell me a bit about your podcast. So I, I know you kind of run a little thing on the side as well. And you mentioned it briefly at the beginning of the session. Tell me a bit about it. Okay, so I'm going to put my thing down. See my logo, <laughs> Fennels and Fur, 111. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a spiritual podcast every Saturday morning. So I woke up at 4 a.m. today and I did my podcast at 5 a.m. so I could mm -hmm. be ready to, to do um, your chat. Um, basically what I do, I have this folder and I combine during the week, if not even prior months, any type of spiritual readings, reflection stories that touch my heart. Mm. And I pick a theme, usually Friday night, if not early Saturday morning. So I'll pick a theme and then I'll, I'll look at all the different sheets I have and I kind of merge them all together and I read all the different reflections and then I put in my two cents and my feelings or mm. what happened to me during the week. Um, when I was initially doing it as an email, I, I started this 10, 11 years ago. I don't know the exact date, uh. but I had 500 friends in media, music, ministry that I would send out an email blast every Saturday morning to 500 friends. Mm. Eventually I started, I started, I, I wanted to outreach to more people and I knew I was limited with my own friends. So that's why I got on Facebook. I wasn't a Facebook person. I wasn't a social media person at all, but I couldn't do a friends in the spirit because you have to do an Eddie Luisi page first. And then once mm. you have your own page, then you could do an offshoot. Yeah. Yeah. So I did an Eddie Luisi page, which I just did like Good Morning America pictures behind the scenes. I saw the friends in the spirit. I noticed that when I posted on Eddie Luisi, if I just did pictures, I'd get a few people that did it. But when I got my iPhone and I started doing videos and stuff <laughs> behind the scenes, I had hundreds of people. People liked it. Hmm. So I started doing my friends in the spirit as a video. Greetings and blessings, dear friends in the spirit, as Eddie Luisi. And all of a sudden, more and more people, they liked it. I don't know if mm. they like this Italian face or what they like, <laughs> or they like the personality, or there's just more of a connection this way. Mm. So I started doing videos. And then after I would post them, I would send them out to different groups. I, right. I would make friends, join different groups. So I sent to different groups. And I had a reach of each week, three to 5,000. But then things start happening with Facebook. And, and I don't know if it was with the election and politics, but things started just like closing down and I wasn't getting that reach anymore. Mm, and mm. then a dear friend of mine, um, Cliff, uh, 
he's a, he's an author. He wrote a book, uh, Cliff Falls, mm. Cliff Shipes his name. And he was doing an audio book. And he said, Ed, he said, audio is in. You know, a lot of people don't want to spend time watching videos. So if you do a podcast, he said, people could, while they're in their cars, if they're working out, if they're home cooking, like, so I said, cool. So I started doing podcasts. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, the podcast, only a handful of people really listening to it. Mm. But I am still going to do it because I know in my heart of hearts, what I'm sharing, if it touches one person, one life that I'm doing, I'm doing good. And that's more ministry, right? I'm not really mentoring mm. in that or talking about uh, a lot of TV or music. But if I could touch one heart, if I could help one person, especially now we're recording this during the Christmas sign and there are a lot of people that might be lonely or depressed mm. or hurt. Mm. So one message of hope, you know, and, and, and we just mentioned that. So if this stays in the interview, maybe there's one person out there that needs some love, compassion, some hope. So we're giving it to you right now. Absolutely. And uh, I think this is cool, right? Because, um, a, a lot of people like when we start creating like a podcast or like a YouTube channel or whatnot, a lot of us really kind of want to go like, yes, I want to get like millions of views, what, what not. Right. But the fact that sometimes you even get a hundred views, it's, it's a hundred different people that you, that you've touched with your content. So I think yeah. kind of give grace to yourself. And that is really an incredible feat on its own. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, okay. Well, I mean, it was, it was absolutely amazing speaking with you, Eddie. I think maybe just before we wrapped up for someone say who, um, because I'm just, just kind of thinking about my audience for someone who's looking to kind of build or start their career in music, what's kind of one actionable step. Say if you could only leave them with one thing to do, what would that be for today? If they want to be a writer, a songwriter, write. Right. If you want to be a composer, compose. If you want to record your material, record. And you could go as basic as GarageBand. Mm. And, you know, you don't have to go crazy with Logic and Pro Tools if you're limited. But just do it. Just, just, do, it. just do it. Don't worry about, like you said, thousands and millions of people listening. Just write, 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 create. Once this pandemic is done, go out and perform, 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 right? Mm. So just, you just do it. And, and if you have that talent and, and your voice is supposed to be uh, reachable to people, it will happen. It will happen. 